I can tell you it's, it's an incredible time where kids are being taught God's word on a level that they can really relate to. So I'd encourage you to check that out if you're a visitor here with us today. Um, every word has a field of meaning. That is, it, it has different meanings based on the context within which you use it. For instance, um, this is a trunk, right? We all know what a trunk looks like, but this is also a trunk. And when, when I talk to my software developer friends, they tell me that a trunk is the base of a project which precedes the development. It's what starts it all off, and everything goes out from that. That's a trunk. This, if I were to cut off my legs and my arms and my head, this would be a trunk as well. Some of you are applauding at the thought of that. <laughs> now, this is also a trunk. <laughs> now, grace is a word that has a broad field of meaning. The dictionary defines grace as simple elegance or refinement of movement. Now, I just threw your brain a curveball because in the context of church, that's not the sort of definition that we think when we think of the word grace, when we think of that concept. But here's another one. To do honor or credit to someone or something by one's presence. To grace someone with your Presence. My older brother used to tell me that he was gracing me with his presence just before he pounded on me. Some of you maybe experienced something like that as well. I like the next one because I think it was written by someone who, who had ex often experienced the longer version of this. Grace is also a short prayer of thanksgiving said before or after a meal. Grace is also a period, period, excuse me, officially allowed for a payment of a sum due. Grace is a concept that is difficult to grasp and even more difficult to own because we are not a people who live in a context of grace. We are a good works sort of world in order to get into somebody's good favor, into their grace, we expect that their people are going to do the right things. And we have this concept that in order to get into God's favor, into God's grace, that we are also going to do certain things. So when we think about grace from the biblical perspective, there are several definitions that people have offered to help us wrap our heads around this concept. One would be God's riches at Christ's expense. We have been given God's riches because of what Christ did for us, and that's, that's an important concept with grace. There's also another one, God's unmerited favor. Or another definition is getting what I don't deserve. But I don't think we really understand the concept of grace until we understand the context in which grace can be experienced. The context is God's holiness and my sinfulness. You see, grace doesn't make any sense unless there's something going on that I can't earn my way out of unless there's something that's happened that I need to have God do something about that I can't earn, that I can't do enough to make that thing or make myself worthy of God's goodness. Like, like many of you, I am reading through, a, a, through the Bible in a Year program this, this year, started in January. I'm in the middle of the book of Leviticus. And uh, I have to be honest and say to you that as I got prepared for Leviticus, I thought to myself, oh man, I've got to go through all these rituals. I've got to go through all these different rules and regulations. I've got to, I've got to even think about that poor little lamb when the dad and his sons would come and lay their hands on its head. And the priest would then take a knife and slit its throat. 
And we think, how barbaric. Why would God do that? The only way to understand that is to understand the context in which it took place. The context is God's holiness and my sinfulness. God set up those regulations and rules and that entire sacrificial system to help people realize that they could not just blindly, glibly walk into his presence because sinfulness in the presence of holiness is destroyed every time. And so God wanted them to understand that if you're going to approach me, you must approach me from the perspective of holiness because I am holy and you are not Sin cannot stand in the presence of holiness. But the problem is, and this was the point God wanted the people of Israel and every other religious system who tries to earn their way to him by stacking up their good works, what he wanted us all to understand is that you will never be perfect enough. Matter of fact, these sacrifices had to be done every single year. The Day of Atonement was a sacrifice that had to be made by the males in a family every single year. Now, if that sacrifice could have wiped away their sins, they only would have had to do it one time. So the astute observer would say, wait a minute, we were here last year, and we were here the year before, and we were here 20 years before, and we will be here 20 years into the future. What is going on here? Paul summarized the conclusion that, he, that God wanted them to get from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. He wants us to understand that by observing the law, no one will be justified. There's a fundamental and eternally separating flaw in our thinking that God deals with through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Israel, just like most people on the face of the earth, did not grasp how to become right with God. Every religion in the world can be summarized with one word, except Christianity. Every religion in the world has this one word that summarizes what they're all about and why they do what they do. They want to earn uh, favor with God. There are some that don't believe in God, but those that believe in God want to earn favor with God, and the word they use to describe how you do that is do. It's do. I have to do something. Christianity is different. We have one word that summarizes everything as well. The word is done. Done. We understand that by observing the law, no one is going to be justified. Someone had to fulfill the law. Someone had to make a sacrifice that would no longer have to be made anymore. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 3, and this is out of the New Living Translation, Paul says, For they, that's everyone in the world, don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. They thought, and can I say, that I think sometimes still we who know who Jesus is and understand his sacrifice, still I think sometimes we function under the idea that we have to earn God's favor. We think we earn it by obeying rules and regulations by, by doing things right by stacking them up by feeling like if, if I stand before God I hope that my goodness outweighs the bad things that I've done Romans 10.5 again in the New Delivering Translation says for Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commandments see the problem is if we're going to go on the basis of our obedience to the commandments, we have to obey every law. We have to obey it every time. We have to obey it perfectly because perfection before God comes with perfect obedience of every commandment all the time and in every way. If 
if we live in the context of good works, we will always be disappointed. We will always fall far short. What we don't realize is that we could never be good enough to keep the law perfectly. And because we cannot keep the law perfectly, and even though we continue to try, we will fall short of the perfection that God demands. So, God knew that, and he intervened for you and for me. And he gave us a way, a clear way, to become perfect with him. To come into a close relationship with him so that the once sinful person may become righteous so that that righteous person can stand in the presence of a righteous and holy God. Back to Romans 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God And it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are all the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Rather than obeying the law, working, earning, stacking up our good works against our bad, this passage says, anyone who trusts in him field of meaning anyone who puts their faith in him anyone who believes in him anyone who thinks that earning doesn't get them there but only faith in Christ that person will never be disgraced remember our word grace to be disgraced means to be removed from grace to be moved out from under grace is covering and to be standing there naked before God with no righteousness of, of imputed to us, given to us by grace, in our own righteousness, and we will always, always, always be disappointed. Put your faith in Jesus, and you'll never be disgraced. Maybe you're here today, and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. Today might be a day for you to consider that. Instead of leaning on your own good works, instead of leaning on yourself, instead of leaning on church attendance or or scripture memory or, or anything like that, leaning completely and wholly on Jesus because he is the only source of salvation. So we come full circle then, back to our understanding of grace. Grace, God's unmerited, unearned, not able to be worked for favor. It makes all the difference. For it is by grace you've been saved, Ephesians 2 says. Through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our connection with God flows from the gracious heart of our loving Father and is acquired by me through faith, not by works, not by being a good person. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Christ. I move from the context of works to a context of grace, and I don't even have to work to get there. God moves me from a context of good works to the context of grace, his unmerited, undeserved, unearned, unworked for favor, and I don't even have to work to get it. I just come to him by faith. And what begins in faith continues in faith. When when you were born into the family of God because of God's undeserved favor, through faith in Christ, you were born complete. And here's the main passage for today. This comes out of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God gives you and me everything we need for life and godliness. Nothing has to be added. Colossians 2.10 summarizes it this way. And in him you have been made complete. Now does that mean that you are 
all that you're ever going to be when you put your faith and trust in Christ. Not at all. Just as a normal baby is born with all the equipment he needs for life and only needs to grow, so the Christian has all that we need and only need to grow. You see, here's an oxymoronic concept. We think that works help us to achieve. The reality is, before God, our works actually cause us to shrink. And His grace causes us to grow. The more we lean into His grace through faith, the more He works in our lives and makes us the people He wants us to be. God never has to issue a recall on any of His models. Because there is no lack, there's no fault, there's no defect. Everything you and I need for life and godliness is ours when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. Just as a baby has an inborn genetic structure that determines how she will grow, so the believer, you and me, are genetically structured by God for life and godliness. Now, the there's, there's something happening here that unless you, I, I give you a little Greek lesson, we'll miss completely. This word life, these phrases, these words, life and godliness, life and godliness are nouns. They're joined with an and, and it's, it's what the Greeks call a, a hendiades. It is a, it is a, it's a two for one. It's a New Testament two for deal here for no extra charge. It's two nouns that, that come together to, meet, to make one concept. So when, we, when you read life and godliness, what he's saying is you have everything you need to live a godly life. You don't need anything more. You have everything you need. You need, just need to drill down into what God has already given you. One day, every single follower of Jesus will stand before Christ holy and perfect, and we will share his glory when he returns to take us to heaven. But our time on earth is our opportunity to cooperate with God so that we can grow a more godly lifestyle and become everything that he wants us to be. He's given us everything we need to grow a godly life. Last week I taught you the exegetes cheer. Do you remember the exegetes cheer? Anybody remember? Context, context, context. A lot of times we get ourselves in trouble when we try to interpret the Bible and we take a verse kicking and screaming out of its context. We need to make sure that we understand the context within which it is written, just like our words can have a field of meaning. So the passages in the scripture come within this context and and we can't just assign a definition to a term because it's in the dictionary. We have to look at the context that's happening here. Well, another piece of context is... um, is, is the historical context in which something is written. Now, what was happening at the time, and one of the things that prompted Peter to write this letter, was there was a group of people called the Gnostics. Um, gnosis is a, is a Greek word that for knowledge. And the Gnostics believed that you, as an immature believer in Jesus, could have some knowledge. But unless you were given some insight, preferably from them, you wouldn't really understand the deeper things of God. You really, what you needed was for some to come alongside, put their arm around you, and share with you the real knowledge, the deep knowledge, the knowledge that's behind that statement that you just read. Now, Peter is saying, you don't need that. You don't need that at all. Matter of fact, you have everything you need for life and godliness. Verse 2 of, of 2 Peter chapter 1 says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Well, what he's talking about there is when he says grace and peace, you've experienced God's grace, you've come into a, a relationship of peace with God. He's talking about the time when you put your faith in Christ and became a believer. And at that moment, you had everything you needed. There is no deeper knowledge for you. There is no meaning behind the meaning. There is no gnosis. That doesn't mean that we don't study the word. We need to drill down into the word. Every one of us needs to be able to understand what the word says and apply it to our lives. So I'm not saying that we don't study the word. What I am saying is, you want to know what the Bible means? Let it say what it says. 
Dig down into the word and let the scriptures teach you what God has in mind for you. Your connection began by faith and continues by faith as we avail ourselves of the resources that he gave us already. His divine power has given us everything we need to grow a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So receiving God's unmerited favor results in peace with God and a godly life. And resulting from that is, the, uh, is from the, that results from the knowledge that God has already given us through his word. Now, verse four says this. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. His very great promises as we grow in our knowledge of them, we will participate in the divine nature. Now, catch that. Two things are happening here. He says, when you meditate on these great, very great promises, you will be able to participate in the divine nature. Remember the context. You and I started off as sinful people wanting to have a relationship with the Holy God. We couldn't get there on our own. So grace came in. And that grace radically, radically changed everything because God made us worthy through what he did for us so that we could then participate in the divine nature. Sinful person who could not stand before a holy God has moved out of the context of our sinfulness and moved in the context of God's righteousness and we can participate in the divine nature and that does not mean we become God it means we become like God so that when people see us they're seeing how God would behave now that's kind of scary to me John 1.18 says that if anyone has seen the son he's seen the father okay now I can I can see that for Jesus People look at Jesus, and, and if you, if you want to know how in the world the God of the Old Testament, the God of the sacrificial system, the God who wiped out entire nations, how he would behave, look at Jesus. By the way, part of the answer to that whole issue of, of this evil ogre sort of God in the Old Testament and this gracious God of love in the New Testament is the context. Sinful man, holy God in law trying to help us earn our way there but grace intervened and changed everything so that God could be gracious and God could be who he really wants to be in our lives but not only do we get to participate in the divine nature but the rest of the passage says that we escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires get this and we've said this, we've pointed this out several times over the last few months. We don't stop sinning by focusing on not sinning. You don't deal with your porn habit by focusing on not looking at porn. You don't deal with your gossip problem by focusing on not gossiping. We deal with our sin problem by focusing on his great promises because then he says when we do that and we fill our minds with his truth we will escape the corruption that's in this world caused by evil desires. If we could become righteous by obeying the law we would be living in the context of good works. And that is not where God wants us to be at all. We sin less because we dig into God's word, allowing the indwelling Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and our minds to, to the truth and to believe his great promises. Allowing them to direct our thinking, to alter our behavior, to transform us so that we live godly lives. 
godly lives that he gave us as a gift so that we could drill into his great promises and allow him to change us from the inside out. The word participate in this, this particular verse is, is kind of interesting to me. It literally means become partners with. It comes from the word, a word that will, may sound familiar to some of you. You're familiar with the word koinonia. Koinonia means fellowship. The word for, for uh, that, that's translated participate here is koinonoiai. It's partners or sharers. So that we get to partake of God's very nature. Each of us growing to be the new creation that he intended us to be. And as we become more intimately acquainted, more personally involved in his word, we continue to grow as partners of God's nature. We become more like him. So the one who was once a sinner now becomes a saint in the presence of a holy and a righteous God. We don't have to worry anymore about following all those rituals and following all those rules and following all the regulations and, and laying our hands on the, the head of a what seems to be an innocent animal to us and cut its throat because Christ did all that for us so that we could become more like him. So I guess the question I, I want to challenge us with as we draw this to a close is how can you know if you're living in the context of good works? Or how can you know if you're living in the context of grace? Well, the measuring stick or the standard, if you're living in the context of good works, would be your good works. How many of them are there? How does your good works compare to somebody else's? Really, when you push it down to its lowest common denominator... It's really not good works and it's really not a comparison with somebody else. It's really myself. It's me. It's how good do I really think I am? We ask questions like, did I do the right thing? Am I good enough? Is God pleased with me? If you're asking those kinds of questions, you might be living in the context of good works. But to live in the context of grace, the measuring stick or the standard is God's word. It's God's great promises, and it's my faith. Remember, my salvation began with faith, and it will continue in faith as I believe what God tells me. And as I believe what God tells me, he will change my behavior. And as he changes my behavior, he will transform my life. I will ask questions like this if I'm living in a context of grace. What has God said? Do I believe it? Am I living it? What are some of those very great promises? Last week, we, we took some time and we listed off several passages that, that, that talk about what's ours based on our relationship with Jesus through the phrase, in Christ. Because I'm in Christ, these things are true of me. This week, I, I want to point out in First and Second Peter, three of the great promises that if we will believe them, can radically change how we live our lives. But it's got to start by me willingly moving from a context of good works to a context of grace and deciding I'm going to believe what God says. The first one is, my inheritance is not of this world and is secure. My inheritance is not of this world and it is secure. My, the, 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 the earning that I do is not about my 401k. It's not about my retirement plan. It's not about all those things. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But when it comes right down to what's most important, my inheritance is not of this world and it is secure. This is what he says in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, 
kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that was ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? How will this truth prompt me to live a godlier life? And if I were brave, bold enough to ask the Spirit, I might ask Him, how would you like to grow a godlier life in me through this promise? Do we believe it? A second promise. God's word is reliable. You can believe God's word. You can bank on God's word. You can trust God's word. Now, I said earlier that we don't just take things blindly. Study them. Dig into them. I can promise you as you dig into the word of God, you will find that it is true. You will find that it is faithful. And we start in that place of exploration. It's okay. Check it out for yourself. But I believe that God's word is reliable and this is what Peter says. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Do we believe this? How will this truth impact the way I live? Spirit, how do you want to use this to make me grow as a godlier person? The last one. Jesus' return is certain and could be at any moment. Jesus' return is certain. He is coming back. And it could be at any moment. It is imminent. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. It's as if he asked the questions for us. Do you believe this promise? How will this truth prompt you to live a godlier life? And how does the Spirit want to use this promise to help me grow a godlier lifestyle? I want to challenge you. I know that this has been a review for many. But like Paul said, it's a good thing for us to review some of the, some of the, the core truths. And it's, it's good for all of us to remember it. This is, this is the gospel. It is the good news that radically changes us. That Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived the perfect life, died in my place, and rose from the dead so that he could give life to you and to me. I acquire that life through faith and I continue growing in that life through faith alone in God's precious great promises. Pick one of these promises. Pick just one. Maybe pick from the, the, the list that we used last week of the things that are true of us because we're in Christ. Pick one and spend some time this week and meditate on it. And ask yourself these questions. How will this truth impact the way I live today? How will the truth that's in this promise impact the way I live today? Listen then to God's spirit and ask this question. How do you intend to grow a godlier life in me through the promise that's here? Because I think that God wants us to participate in his great promises and choose to live in the context of grace. It's a choice. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for grace and goodness. Thank you that we don't have to earn our way to heaven. We've all experienced that the reality that there, there's no way we could. We can never be good enough 
But we come to you right now and we offer ourselves and we ask you to work in us. Father, I pray that the, the precious promises that we've looked at today would so captivate our hearts and minds that your spirit would, would cause them to come to life for us and help us to, to live the life you want us to. Help us to follow after you with everything that we have. Lord, deliver us from, from the, the works mindset that pervades our culture, especially the culture in the church. And God, flood us with your, with your grace and help us to see our life of faith growing more and more as godly men and women. In Jesus' name, amen.